Sir, Professor Caldor's prediction of intractable difficulties in the medium term if Britain joins the European community is ill concerned. On one point he is clearly wrong that entry into the community will necessitate a large initial reduction in the level of real wages. This is contrary to experience in the community. Is the same as it was when the white paper was written. Sir, that agricultural having just read the government's white paper on the common market, I am more than ever convinced that this country has no choice other than to join the EEC. Letters to the Times, a traditional British way of making a public point about the great issues of the day. Back at the start of the 1970s, the greatest issue of the day was whether Britain ought to become European, sign up with the European Economic Community. And had you been scanning the correspondence columns of the Times in the autumn of 1970 and on into the next year, you might have noticed a flood of letters in support of our application to join the EEC. Nothing odd about that, nothing particularly suspicious. That is, until I went to interview an old Foreign Office hand a couple of years ago for an earlier programme in the document series. As Norman Redaway and I talked about a little-known department in the Foreign Office called IRD, the Information Research Department, Redaway let slip that a good many of those letters were stage-managed into the Times on behalf of the then-Conservative government. We were trying to support Ted Heath's ambition to get us into Europe. We had one or two brilliant people. There was a chap called uh, Tommy Tucker, who, who was uh, head of the editorial section of IRD. And we worked out a little drill uh, whereby what came in in the morning would go down to Lord Chumley, what was he called, a double-barreled name. And he had a handicapped secretary called Addison Christopher, who had a, a lot of connections. I mean, MPs were, were around, uh, and if they got the right information, right speed, right hands, right form, uh, who would be very glad to write letters to the Times. And uh, we averaged uh, a letter to the press or an article every day for uh, a couple of years. Is that just an old man telling a tale, or an early example of the dark arts of political spin doctoring? And who was that woman, Alison Christopher, and little Tommy Tucker? And why did Edward Heath's government need to pack the letters columns of the Times? Here were bits and pieces of a jigsaw that cried out to be put together. So, last autumn, we decided to talk to Norman Redaway again, but sadly, he died before we could meet. All that survived them was a snatch of tape, our document, as it were, with an allegation on it. And, of course, the politics of the early 1970s, which seemed like the best place to try and pick up the scent of Norman Redaway's story. We believe that the prosperity of Britain and the standard of living of all our peoples, which is what it means, would improve faster if we were inside the common market than if we remained outside. In December 1970, the opinion polls showed 70% of the public against membership and only 18% in favour. Although it wasn't up to the public to decide, as it was later on during the referendum, nevertheless, with this sort of hostility, Parliament would have had great difficulty in passing it. Ernest Wistrich, who in the 1970s was in charge of the European movement in Britain. And there was the political problem. The Conservative Party, who'd won an unexpected victory in the general election of 1970, were committed to negotiating their way into the European Economic Community. The new Prime Minister, Edward Heath, after all, was a lifelong European. But public opinion in Britain was distinctly lukewarm about Brussels and all its works. Twice before, under previous governments, Tory and Labour, we'd been given our marching orders by the French. So why try to join a club that didn't want us? How to change public opinion? Make the case for Europe in the newspapers. And that's where the woman mentioned by Norman Redaway joins the story. Her name, you'll recall, Alison Christopher. She was personal assistant to the Conservative MP Sir Tufton Beamish and a friend to all those pro-European Tories in the House of Commons like Sir James Spicer. Well, she was a sort of um, almost MI5, MI6 rolled into one. The most amazing woman. Uh, she was struck down by polio at the age of 19, 20. She lived in a wheelchair, and uh, she ran Tufton extremely well. She ran me extremely well. And because we all had great confidence in her, she was in a position to, unseen, 
virtually to get us to sign letters when and if they were required to the press. Where did she operate from? From a basement room just off Sloan Square. That sounds very, um, <laughs> very undercover. But it was. It was a tiny little office um, with always a good glass of sherry there. But, uh, I mean, we had a little... Um, gathering every Wednesday morning of people, mostly MPs, and each and every one of those on a Wednesday, if they were asked to sign a letter, would very happily do it. And I think the same group still exists today, and they still are. But we don't talk about it. it you know, it was a... I look back 30 years, and I think of a very happy group of people who really had this shared belief. Our position was pro-European, but we had a policy of allowing the debate to take place freely. Lord Rees-Mogg, who, as William Rees-Mogg, was the editor of the Times back in the 70s. I simply think that, that at that time, the pro-people uh, understood the issues better, had a, a more sophisticated approach, whereas the anti-people were, in fact, uh, or included a, a significant number of what you could regard as backwoodsmen. But it would be possible to manipulate uh, the correspondence from outside without necessarily your editorial staff or yourself being alerted. Well, if you had a lot of um, people who uh, were persuaded that they ought to send in letters which were in fact drafted by somebody else, then obviously you could organise a, a better correspondence on your side than if you just left it to the general public. I think, I think that's probably true. But I imagine most of the letter writers were perfectly genuine people. Letter writing was all very well, but preaching the benefits of British membership of the common market in the letters columns of the Times really was preaching to a pretty small congregation. The big prize was to convert the millions of people who didn't read the Times. And that began and continued through 1970 and 1971 here in the heart of Mayfair. I'm walking to one of London's most exclusive hotels, the Connaught, where every week, as Edward Heath's government inched Britain towards Europe, Geoffrey Tucker, an advertising guru who helped to market the Conservative Party, organised breakfasts for the political shakers and the media movers of the day. Very good breakfast, too, to judge by this hotel's reputation. Ted, very typically, said, well, if that's your opinion, get on with it. And that's what I did. Geoffrey Tucker, master of the breakfast ceremonies at the Connaught and a passionate European, told Edward Heath that he knew how to swing the great British public behind the government's European adventure. I went to the European movement and uh, talked to them and they helped to, to put the funding together for a breakfast which we held at the Connaught Hotel. And Ernest Wistrich was there actually to be briefed in many ways briefed on how the negotiations, led by Geoffrey Rippon and his most senior civil servant, Crispin Tickell, were going in Brussels. Journalists were there, and captains of industry, editors too, and television people. Ernest Wistrich's European movement was the natural organisation to front the public campaign for Europe. This is where Norman Redaway from the Foreign Office slides into our story again. Was Wistrich the right man for the movement? I remember one day Norman Redaway, uh, after some weeks, coming to me and saying, we're satisfied, you go ahead and run it. What do you think he had to be satisfied mm. about? Well, obviously, I was uh, being vetted for security reasons and other purposes as well. But why, why would security be an issue? Well, this is the odd thing, but it certainly was. I know, I know that. Norman Redaway was the person given to us by the government as our liaison man. And he came to the breakfast carrying his bicycle clips and his furry gloves. And I had an agitated doorman who said to me, excuse me, sir, but I believe you have a Mr. Redway as your guest. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to ask him to desist from his habits. So I said, what habits is this? And he said, we do find it very disturbing when he padlocks his moped to the front railings of the hotel. It's disturbed Mr. David Niven, no end, sir. And I had to ask him if he would padlock it to the back of the hotel. He was a remarkable and delightful and eccentric uh, man. Did you know which department in government he worked for? I uh, did have a, a, an idea, um, it, but it didn't really mean very much to me. I mean, IRD um, was a, 
a, go a government department that he was associated with and a person who also was with him called uh, Tommy Tucker, uh, same name as mine, but he was taller, thinner and better looking than I was and he did a lot of the work. They were very skilled in, in carrying on the work that we did um, into into the press and into uh, publications but I really didn't know very much about him I was I suppose incurious and also Norman was not a person who who sort of was very forthcoming about what he actually did for good reason the information research department in the Foreign Office seems to have had links with the intelligence community Certainly, earlier in his career, Norman Redaway's IRD had played a part in destabilizing the Sukarno regime in Indonesia in the 1960s. Anyway, the 1970s. What was on the political menu at those Connaught breakfasts? Carving up the media, it seems. We had the imprimatur, OK, from Ted. We had the links through Norman Redaway to the Foreign Office. We had a knowledge of what actually was going on from Geoffrey Rippon and from Crispin to Kell. And therefore, we got on with a very specific job. We decided to pinpoint the Today program on radio, picked up by the press and followed right through the news programs during the day, culminating with the news program on ITN at night, which was the big one. So round the table came people uh, like uh, Marshall Stewart, who was the brilliant editor of the Today program, which was a key program. And they sat down with people who were actually negotiating in Brussels. During that time, we achieved a thing which we couldn't have achieved today, which is we got an extra five minutes on the ITN news in the evening, added on, which was purely informative what it meant to the ordinary person. That, and that, five, that five minutes came out of a direct negotiation with Nigel Ryan, who was editor of ITN, across one of those breakfast yeah, tables. Yeah, across one of those breakfast tables. I mean, it was a wonderful, wonderful news opportunity. Even Alistair Campbell couldn't have done better, I, I feel. You mean you were offering them scoops? Yes. Can we go to 68 St. James's in Mayfair, please? Do straight. Yes, please. Thank you very much. So, is there evidence to back this up? There is, and Geoffrey Tucker dispatches me to his office, to Deborah, his personal assistant. Hello? Oh, hello. It's Christopher Cook from the BBC to see oh, Geoffrey yes. Tucker. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of the documents here. Good. This document from Geoffrey Tucker's personal archive is called European Campaign. It's dated 1970-71. On the first page is a paragraph with the heading Objective. I quote, To convince MPs that the tide of British public opinion is moving towards joining the EEC. Then, in a later paragraph on Method, you find we must rely greatly on the fast media. Therefore, television and radio will play the major part in the campaign. The television programs News at 10, 24 Hours and Panorama are mentioned. And from radio, World at One, Today and Woman's Hour. Four pages further on comes this. Nobbling is the name of the game. Throughout the period of the campaign, there should be direct day-by-day -day communication between the key communicators and our personnel e.g. the Foreign Commonwealth Office and Marshall Stewart of the Today Programme. And in 1970, the Today Programme was presented by Jack DiManio. The Confederation of British Industries comes out today with a critical report on the way the common market countries' industrial policies would seem to have prevented supranational companies from playing their full part in Europe's economy. Ian Mitchell talked about the... Jack DiManio was a presenter who was terribly anti-European and um, uh, we protested privately about this and he was moved. Whether that was a coincidence or not, I really don't know. I'm sure that um, a lot of people would uh, say that uh, that undue pressure wasn't applied but I don't think the spin doctors would find that strange at all today. I just said, uh, listening to him, it uh, seems to me that this man is giving a totally unbalanced view. It would appear that there, that there is nothing good about Europe at all.
and uh, Ian Trethan listened, and De Manio was replaced. Ian Trethan was then the managing director of BBC Radio and a known friend of Edward Heath. Another of Geoffrey Tucker's breakfast guests was Roy, now Lord Hattersley, a leading figure in the pro-European faction in the Labour Party. The one breakfast I went to was a very chummy affair. We were all on the same side. We were all European propagandists. We were all fighting the European cause. To the extent that some of the protagonists actually drew Ian Trothowne's attention to broadcasters who they thought had been anti-European and asked him to do something about it. And I was so shocked that I decided I couldn't go again. It sounds terribly prissy and I feel rather ashamed of being so biased. But it really did shock me at the time and frankly, remembering it, it shocked me still. Was it just a coincidence that Jack DeManio ceased to present the Monday to Friday editions of the Today programme in the middle of 1971? Absolutely, says Marshall Stewart, who was in charge of the programme in the early 1970s. It had always been his intention to have the programme presented by a current affairs journalist, which DeManio was not. Meanwhile, Geoffrey Tucker and his allies were turning the tide of public opinion. There was a distinct shift of opinion a measurable, substantial shift of opinion between the beginning of July and the end of July. And at that breakfast I said, we've done it. Which must have been music to the ears of Edward Heath, the Prime Minister. As that went on, so the support in public opinion polls steadily mounted until when we got to the point of uh, finally concluding the negotiation, we had just on 50% support, which was very considerable. The Department in the Foreign Office, IRD, what were they doing in terms of keeping the debate going, keeping a flow of information going for you? Um, they, were, they were keeping the various departments and agencies informed uh, as to how everything was moving outside in, in the contest. And it, was, uh, it wasn't propaganda, it was proper information. How helpful was the European movement? Oh, very you? helpful. Uh, they worked very hard and uh, they received funds from supporters which enabled them to publish their own literature as well as ours. They also hosted a series of breakfasts at the Connaught yeah. Hotel. H how valuable do you think they were? I mean there's always a group in a great city like this which meets regularly at breakfast and it's not uh, a particular means that I favour but um, they like it and say who provide them with what they're asking for. You've got to get in to get on. You must move ahead or we fall behind. Nothing in life stays the same. You've got to get in to get on. We issued uh, a newspaper called the you got a copy of that's that. right I've got copies here called the British European edited by that famous cartoonist Philip Zick and uh, we distributed massive numbers of them freely uh, we used to have for instance in the summer on the beaches we had young women giving them away and they used to wear uh, uh, t-shirts with the message Europe or bust <laughs> <laughs> T-shirts, a newspaper, bumper stickers and posters, a pop song, not to mention breakfasts at the Connaught Hotel. Making friends and influencing people on this scale never comes cheap. So who was picking up the tab? Sir James Spicer. Within business and industry there was tremendous support and backing and of course a great deal of money. I mean the figure of five million pounds has been banded about in that period from 1771 in particular, which flooded into the European movement and to the Conservative group for Europe. Uh, one of the people who uh, was very helpful in uh, raising funds for us was Geoffrey Archer. And who paid for the breakfast at the Connaught Hotel? I think this was... Uh, you have to talk to Geoffrey Tucker because he was the one man who organised them. Who paid for the breakfasts? Well, I didn't, I've, I've never really had uh, um, much 
knowledge of, of the funding quite deliberately, but also because I'm not uh, very good at that kind of uh, uh, thing. I paid uh, uh, for one or two. You paid out of your own pocket? Yes. The European movement certainly paid uh, for them. I don't know. I couldn't be certain about this, but I would I would guess that the European movement paid for most of them. It's sometimes alleged that the funds that came to the European movement had come in uh, often rather curious ways from the CIA in the United States. Is there mm. anything you've heard? Yeah, I, 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 uh, and I was uh, absolutely uh, um, uh, astonished uh, by it. I was rather tickled about it. I, frankly, I didn't, uh, I didn't care uh, where the money came from. Uh, I didn't know about it. It could come from anywhere, as long as it was there to do the job. That allegation that the CIA were involved in promoting a united Europe. It was the simplest of questions which led to the most surprising discovery about Edward Heath's campaign to persuade the British people that to join the EEC was in their best national interests. Who paid for the European movement? Who financed the publicity campaign? Dr Richard Aldrich teaches in the Department of Politics at Nottingham University where he edits the Journal of Intelligence and National Security. And while researching the links between the CIA and the ideal of a united Europe, Aldrich found himself working in the library of Georgetown University in Washington. I was absolutely astonished to discover that, that, that the, uh, the library had the entire archive of a CIA front organization, which documents from start to finish, funneling millions of dollars into Europe, into Britain, with all its accounts, with all its receipts, with correspondence, for example, from, from British Labour MPs to individuals in, in American intelligence organizations. And so I was absolutely astonished when I opened these dusty brown cardboard boxes which weren't considered to be terribly important and discovered one of the most exciting intelligence archives perhaps of the post-war period. That begs a question. Why was Washington so interested in Western Europe? The United States had invested a great deal of money in European recovery with the idea that only a recovered Western Europe would be able to resist um, Soviet encroachment and the, the United States is keen to see a federalist Europe because it views Europe almost in its own image. The Americans continually talk about the United States of Europe. So if the CIA were bankrolling European Union, how come that no one noticed who was paying the piper? The whole accounting structure of the European movement was designed to hide the fact that CIA money was coming in. And the way this was done was to have a core budget that covered the fairly mundane activities of, of, of running the European movement's office, um, paying for the cleaners, paying for the typewriters. All this came out of money that was generated in Europe. And the CIA money was hidden by putting most of the operational costs of the European movement, for example, the European youth campaign, into these special budgets which were not subject to the normal accounting procedures. It was possible to hide CIA money and indeed make sure that most people in the European movement were unaware that the CIA money was coming in. Very few people at the top were actually aware of, of, of where this funding was coming from. Here is the result I have got it, and four, 356 against 244. So the majority for joining the market in the, in the House of Commons is 112. I'll repeat that result. Third time lucky, Britain was on course to full membership of the European Economic Union. Letters in the Times have led us to breakfasts at the Connaught Hotel, the intelligence services, and across the Atlantic to the CIA. And it's alleged to a Prime Minister having his knuckles wrapped by William Armstrong, his most senior civil servant. Armstrong, it said, wasn't at all happy about what Norman Redaway and the Information Research Department in the Foreign Office had been up to in the early 1970s, which was a great deal more than simply writing letters to the Times newspaper praising Europe to the skies. And Geoffrey Tucker's breakfast party? Well, that was no longer required. We were disassembled by um, Edward Heath after we'd done our job. Um, the Foreign Office was withdrawn, and this was done at the behest of Sir William Armstrong, who was the head of the civil service, and who was um, pretty anti-European. We were told, you know, finished. But Geoffrey Rippon, who's a passionate European, he knew, as I knew, that the battle for Europe 
wasn't over and probably never would be over and that we would have to keep something like this going. Do you still have breakfast? Uh, yes. For Europe or for other things? Um, I have uh, breakfast for Europe, yes. So the battle is not finally over? The battle will never be over. Nor the battle to influence the voters' opinion for or against the European Union. Lord Hadsley thinks that it was the way that that battle was fought which has turned it into a 30 years war. What we did throughout all those years, all the Europeans, was say, let's not risk trying to make fundamental changes by telling the hard truth. Let's do it through public relations rather than real proselytising. And IRD was always wanting to spin the arguments rather than expose the arguments. And that clearly, in your view, was the wrong approach? Not only was it wrong for us to deal superficially with what Europe involved, but we've paid the price for it ever since. Because every time there's a crisis in Europe, people say, with some justification, well, we wouldn't have been part of this if we'd really known the implications. Joining the European community did involve significant loss of sovereignty. But by telling the British people that was not involved, I think the rest of the argument was prejudiced for the next 20 20, 30 years. Those who spin are bound to prick their fingers then. Or to put it another way, when Edward Heath delved into Europe, while Norman Redaway and friends span their version of the story, nothing was decided once and for all. A source of deep regret to Sir Edward Heath. I hoped that when we got in, um, that then we would have agreement that we were there and there to stay and to make it work. But now we find that uh, the two major parties in our country could not find permanent agreement. And what happened was that um, when one was in power, it was in favor, and when it wasn't in power, it was against. The, the present Conservative Party has now turned completely against it. And this I find the most devastating blow of all.